So you're saying the third year students uh, place themselves in the sixth to the ninth. Hundred and forty-five, and it's two o nine. So since yes. we try to start on time, let's go for it. Yes. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So uh, good afternoon to first <clears throat> my wonderful panel that has taken the time out. Uh, you know, everyone thinks that it's the lockdown and so everybody needs to have this endless stream of time. It's not so. We have two hoteliers who are training their staff to make sure that they are ready for when uh, the hotels open back again in completion. Uh, I have uh, Mr. Dale Edwards who, um, you know, is still getting all the uh, Trinity uh, SOPs together for post. I have Sachi who is working on Zoom classes even when uh, the lockdown's down. So having the time to come here is extremely, we are extremely honored and privileged. Um, and I thank uh, Lenka ma'am for making sure that this has all been curated. I'm going to start off with a little, uh, if, uh, if you would, wouldn't mind indulging me, uh, start off with a little bit about Don Bosco. Uh, Melroy, can I have the slide on Don Bosco, please? Yes, ma'am. All right, so just a little bit, and this is to most of you who have seen, uh, this is our brochure, but just to let you know that Don Bosco was started in 2000, the Don Bosco College of Hospitality was started in 2008. Uh, we belong to the Salesian community, uh, which is a community of priests, lay uh, brothers and sisters who work towards one very specific mission, and that is to educate and empower the young. With that in mind, Don Bosco College of Hospitality was study, uh, studies were started in 2008 with a mere 12 students. And we have come a long way since then. And we have a very, very, very specific mission. Our mission is to make sure that we groom every student into a professional, into a good hotelier and into a good human being. <clears throat> With that in mind, obviously, we get to the most important, I guess, pivotal uh, requirement for a professional in the, hotel, in the hotel business, in the hospitality business, and that is communication. It has been said by Peter Drucker, the most important thing in communication is to hear what is not being said. However, when you do say, and you do communicate, and you do verbalize, you must always be able to convey exactly what you're trying to, uh, to say. You have to listen. There will be nonverbal communication that will happen at the same time. You have to learn how to control your emotions while you are talking. Otherwise, you'd be saying one thing and meaning a totally different, uh, uh, different thing. And above all, you have to learn how to control your stress. All this so that, especially in the hotels, you have to the, have the ability to verbalize in such a manner that you will be able to gain trust not only of your guests, but of your team, to be able to build the morale, to be able to direct vision and goals, and then to secure every single person to understand what their role is towards the specific job and then towards the bigger mission. With that in mind, I would like to invite and thank each one Dale Edwards, Sachi Bora, Miss Adia, and Mr. Ashish to this wonderful panel. Uh, I would like to uh, now uh, just a little brief on uh, Miss Adia and Miss Ashish, uh, Mr. Ashish, and then uh, Miss Alenka, who is our lecturer for communications, will give you a brief on Dale and Sachi. On behalf of my entire team, my students, my ex-students, and all the wonderful guests who have joined us, thank you very much for making sure that this happens, that this is beautifully curated, and that is put together 
in such a manner that the students are completely impacted and they understand that if it wasn't for communication, they are not going to succeed. Ms. Adia uh, started her, uh, her, well, Adia and Ashish were both at uh, Aurangabad doing their hotel management. Uh, Adia not only did her hotel management, but she also finished uh, Spanish with uh, the Institute of uh, Hispania at Cordoba. She started her career as a management trainee with the Marriott Hotel. She has also worked for Hilton Blackpool in the UK and then came back home to work at Taj West End Bangalore. Being a manager in learning and development, she found her niche, worked for a while with the Oberoi group, but then came back to the Taj group. And we have known her as this extremely effective and absolutely nurturing manager for learning and development. And it's no doubt that she, with that, she won best learning and development resource for the year 2008 from Taj Awards and Business Excellence, and also best learning and development by the Federation of Hotel and Restaurant Association for 2016 and 17. Miss Adi, we're so happy to have you here. And just my personal experience is Adia has been a source of, of a resource for the college, a support, a cheerleader, and a mentor, not only to the institute, to the students, to the staff, and to our overall mission of making sure that we empower our youth. Thank, Thank you, you Adia. Thank, Thank you, you Adia. And now, Mr. Ashi Shetty, who's Director of Quality Assurance, uh, you know, my uh, interaction with Ashish, uh, I have to say, I, I think I, uh, I was absolutely awestruck by the way in which he connects with his trainees, uh, because I had to come to St. Regis to, to talk to one of my students who was being truant. And uh, that was the first uh, time that I met Ashish and have never been uh, disappointed with the way he simply goes beyond uh, beyond everything to make sure that his uh, trainees are mentored and empowered. Uh, like Adhya, um, Ashish uh, has also been from Aurangabad. He has started his, uh, his career as a student at, uh, at uh, the hotel management school in Aurangabad. Uh, went on, however, he, has, he started off with a, with a BCom, then went into hotel management, then into a post diploma from TIS uh, in human resources. Uh, started his career at Bahrain, then went on to be the assistant food and beverage manager at the Taj West in Bangalore. And from 2013 has been the training manager and director of quality assurance at St. Regis. Um, needless to say, we have a whole uh, uh, gamut of students that uh, Ashish has, has uh, trained and uh, they have blossomed under his, uh, his mentorship. We even had one student who was just on a webinar uh, and uh, Jonathan, who could not uh, contain himself about how, what an impact you have made on his life. So I thank you for that. And I look forward to this wonderful hour together. Ms. Alenka? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, so uh, once again, a very good afternoon to uh, lovely panelists for uh, the day and also good afternoon to uh, all our participants and all our listeners. Um, it is truly an honor to uh, co-host this webinar mm -hmm. with you, Mangal Ma'am, and as well as to, uh, you know, share this platform with our very experienced and esteemed panelists, Ms. Adia, Ms. Sachi, Mr. Ashish, and uh, Mr. Dale. For all our participants who have joined us for this webinar, I just have to First, reiterate the emphasis we at Don Bosco College Hospitality Service place on the significance of being able to communicate effectively. Our head of the department, Ms. Annabel Rodriguez, has been the forerunner for this cause and has always urged us, encouraged us to initiate workshops, courses in college that would help solidify the noteworthiness of conducting oneself with utmost professionalism. So uh, Annabel, ma'am, firstly, thank you for highlighting the need 
of every DBCHS student to not only focus on grades, to not only be worried about marks, but also to holistically develop themselves into confident individuals by actively participating in several workshops that we conduct in college. And uh, with that, uh, may I please introduce uh, the very charming and the very poised founder of Ikigai Education Labs, Ms. Sachi Bora. Ms. Sachi has been instrumental in conducting several workshops in public speaking and soft skills for our students in DBCHS. And let me tell you, uh, Sachi ma'am, they have benefited immensely from all those wonderful interactive workshops that you, uh, you know, have been conducting in college with us. Um, a little bit about uh, Ms. Sachi. She has finished her bachelor's in arts and psychology. And with this background in psychology and an international certification in soft skills training, Sachi has worked with various schools span India as a teacher, a mentor, a trainer, a consultant with a decade long experience in the field of education. Also as a mentor for Teach for India, that has allowed her to work with the grassroots levels of the Indian education system and teaching and learning practices for followed globally. Along with being the founder of an education consulting startup, she has also experienced, had the experience of training over 800 teachers across the country, a thousand and more students in soft skills, and 500 and more parents through enrichment programs, and also setting up two K-12 schools span India. Uh, I think uh, meeting you, talking to you, interacting you so frequently, uh, Ms. Sachi, it has truly been insightful. And uh, in my experience, it's always you're such a bundle of energy and enthusiasm and truly charming. So welcome to this webinar, Sachi ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Um, thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Our next uh, panelist is Mr. Dale Edwards, the India Head Academic Support Trinity College London. Mr. Dale has a long-standing association with the BCHS, a warm, exuberant, and a very articulate gentleman with the flair for the English language and a passion to teach. Um, Mr. Dale has um, a bachelor's degree in accounting and finance, and he was pursuing his uh, chartered accountancy, but a professional onstage host, a compare and anchor for the last 28 years, hosted several events, roundtable conferences, product launches, fashion shows, award ceremonies, and the like. Mr. Edwards is a credential trainer from Dale Carnegie and holds an ATCL and LTCL with distinction in communication skills from Trinity College London. He has been awarded fellowships from Trinity College London and London College of Music in communication skills for practice and teaching. Mr. Dale is one of our leading teachers of communication skills in the Indian subcontinent. And over the last four years, he has been instrumental in teaching and growth of life skills training in schools across India. He also has been awarded a master's in teaching and for his thesis, oral communication skills in the 21st century, a teacher resource to training children in schools. Mr. Edward also consults for leading organizations in India like Reliance Industries, Franklin Templeton and so on. Mr. Dale Edwards, truly a pleasure to have you here as part of our panelists for this webinar and looking forward to a wonderful afternoon. So thank you everyone. Thank you and very much. Welcome. Yes, welcome. Thank you. Uh, so, um, Annabel, ma'am, I think we will uh, now proceed with, uh, you know, our, uh, our session for the afternoon. So, uh, Ms. Adya, Mr. Ashish, and uh, Ms. Sachi, as well as Dale. Um, so, as we go on, we would just like to, you know, uh, enlighten our students firstly about uh, the relevance of the need for proficient English uh, language for our students. So, uh, to Ms. Adya and uh, Mr. Ashish. I mean, I would like to first ask you, uh, Ms. Adya, how relevant is the need for proficient uh, English language skills for students in the hospitality industry? Okay. How relevant do you think it is? Uh, Ms. Adya? She calls anybody. Well, I don't know what is going on. I think there's somebody think who's trying to communicate as well, who's not Adya. I think, I think they have put it on by mistake. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, Ms. Adya, would you like me to repeat the question? Yeah, I uh, it's fine. Annabelle yeah, shared with yeah. me a cheat copy of all the questions. Okay, okay. <laughs> Though I think today I'm just going to be speaking impromptu because uh, we've yeah, yeah, done sure. quite a few um, searches amongst various campuses for great talent. 
and the uh, and the format of how we select the students has completely changed or i wouldn't say students but future hoteliers and mm -hmm. since i've had a uh, exposure at the jw marriott as well as the mm -hmm. obroy and as well as the thing for so hotels by and large all of us look at conversational ability right. so more than the language itself we look at conversational ability and uh, when you're trained in your mother tongue when you're trained in hindi which is our uh, which is our language in india uh, it, and and english is what we it's learned over the years so some schools right. teach it and some schools we pick it up and some schools mm -hmm. it's the education from primary is is to do with english so therefore it's a learned language so uh, so recently a um, uh, lot of our guests have started becoming patient with a lot of our colleagues who speak in the language especially you know when it, when we have beautiful accents from all over india showcasing the language so uh, so we've started educating our guests as well saying that this is what our culture has to offer and um, and uh, but however having said that uh, after arabic and chinese i think english is the widely most widely spoken language in the world and uh, there are a lot of guests who expect our colleagues to speak the language not right. just speak it but to understand more importantly of what they're trying to right. say and also um, that when there is a little bit of leisure time uh, the fact that you can have a story the fact that you can interweave a little bit of humor as well as some local uh, things that we uh, you know that is interesting to know which is an insider information because most right. guests have now become travelers they're not really tourists anymore so it is very very relevant at this Thanks. time yeah yes thank you thank you so much radhya ma'am uh, mr ashish would you care to throw some light on that as well about you know the language skills for students in hospitality Mr. Ashish, can you hear me? We can't hear you, Ashish. Ah, uh, Mr. Ashish, I uh, I think you're on mute. Yes. Ah, uh, sir, we can't hear you yet. Oh dear. Oh. Um, I, okay, I think we'll we'll work on that, ma'am. I think they'll we'll sort that out. But I will uh, move on to uh, Mr. Dale if that's okay. Yes, sir. Sir. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. So. Uh, uh, yeah. So, how do you think, uh, sir? This, you know, the Trinity Language course validates this uh, the proficiency in hospitality. Well, it's not just actually. If you look at it, um, in fact, Adia made yes. a very interesting point. Yeah. She said the world has changed in terms of. um you no longer have tourists you have travelers you no longer look at a language purely from the purpose of a language you look at a language mm -hmm. from your ability to be communicative and mm -hmm. i particularly love the fact that she referred to you know just like you sensitize guests to appreciate all the local accents um language has also become that way where right. we there is there used to be this misnomer that i have to conform myself to a queen's english but truth mm -hmm. be told in today's day and age in india actually we are the largest english language speaking country by number um mm -hmm. and so hence the definition of queen's english per se is also out the window in fact who's mm -hmm. not to say that today indian english is actually the definitive english and more so particularly if you're from the western part of the country um we're kind of accent neutral in many many ways so i genuinely believe that um firstly look at english as a language uh, is perhaps the one way to look at it but the much larger way to look at it is perhaps to be it's communicative in its nature and um it's not just the speaking and the listening element it's that interactive listening and the interaction really that makes language come alive and strike up those ever so memorable relationships or conversations or chats that may happen sometimes in a fleeting moment yet you can connect at a much right. deeper level only because um of our ability to interpret and our ability to respond um of course which kind of comes when you are a little more secure in the language 
So two hundred percent. I mean, just like service is indispensable to the hospitality industry, I think mm-hmm. communicative ability uh, is indispensable to the English language. And I must point out over here that you see, there's a lot of places and a lot of organizations that would pay lip service to teaching English. Um, and I mean, India is a perfect example also of that. Um, but it truly takes, um, firstly, one to understand the depth of what you're really trying to get at in within acquiring a subject. So if you're actually saying, I want to do an English course, then there's a dime a dozen who probably position outside every railway station that can provide you that. Um, but then you realize that English is not learned in a book. It's right. learned by use every day on the job in a variety of ways and contexts. So it's also growing even as we speak. The, um, the cross connections that get built and the correlations and the co-locations all keep happening as we keep evolving. So it's 200%, I would say, the, um, the, um, the bed in which hospitality lies, I think, is rooted to a very large extent in the English language, also because it is lingua franca at the end of the day. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Dale. In fact, I think the fact that you brought about the point of not just merely speaking the language, but the, you know, the interactive ability. In fact, uh, I think Ms. Ashi would definitely love to add the aspect of soft skills and how, how important it is, right? Uh, the role it plays along with speaking well. Yes, Ms. Ashi? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think I, I love uh, the point that Mr. Dale just shared about it's not just about the listening and the speaking aspect, but it's also mm-hmm. the aspect to be communicative. Right. Uh, and that's so, so important because uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, no matter what you say and the words that you use, it's your soft skills that actually create those lasting impressions on the people that you interact with, right. uh, you know, and uh, today companies are uh, largely investing in training their employees in soft skills, you know, in organizations, schools, you know, they want their front facing employees to conduct themselves in a manner where they're able to make their guests feel a certain way where they're able to, you know, put forth, uh, you know, the image of, uh, you know, what their service is like in that one conversation or in that one interaction that they have with their guests, or, uh, you know. So that is, of course, something that's very, very important. And this is something that I largely tell uh, a lot of the young adults that I work with, uh, you know, when I'm training. And uh, it takes seven seconds, uh, you know, to create your first impression. And in those seven seconds, uh, you know, you're barely beginning to have a conversation. So not much uh, is really being said in terms of exchange of words in those first seven seconds. But how are you portraying yourself in those first seven seconds can actually go a long way in terms of uh, what that person is really going to think of you when you're out the room. Uh, so your body language, the way you conduct yourself, you know, how you're standing, your posture, your eye contact, how you shake your hands, uh, all of that is very, very important. And, um, you know, your confidence is actually portrayed a, a lot more through your, uh, you know, demeanor than, uh, you know, what you actually speak. So you may not be the most fluent with your English, with your spoken abilities, but you can actually, you know, communicate a lot more through your body language and through your demeanor. I mean, even if you look at our Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, he's not someone who speaks in English very often. He may even go to Madison Square Garden and he'll speak in whatever, you know, in Hindi uh, at times, you know. But at the end of the day, if you look at his persona, if you look at his demeanor, you still want to listen to every single word that he's saying because he knows how to get the audience hooked on. And that's where soft skills is actually, you know, coming into the picture. Uh, you know, your body language, your persona. And uh, a lot of the young adults uh, struggle in that area, in that area of confidence, in that area of, you know, your body language, uh, you know, how you're interacting with the other person. And I always tell them, I tell them that, you know, confidence is not something that someone can give you in a portion that you can just drink up and feel confident. Uh, you know, confidence is a lot to do with mindset. It's a lot to do with how you look at yourself and how you feel and think about yourself. Uh, you know, so... Uh, very, very important to ensure that, uh, you know, you don't let uh, those little inhibitions that you have in your mind, uh, you know, sort of overtake everything else that you have going for you. So whenever it is that you're going for a talk or an interview or interacting with your guests, I think it's very, very important to remind yourself of your strengths, you know, know what works for you, uh, you know, know, uh, you know, what, what aspect of the conversation that you know you can absolutely nail. Uh, that's very, very important and focus on those aspects, dress well, smile, uh, you know, just ensure that your overall demeanor is genial, is pleasant, and uh, those things, you know, really, really get going for you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sachi. In fact, uh, coming back to uh, Miss Adya, you know, uh, both uh, Mr. Dale and um, 
Ms. Sachi they spoke about uh, the interactive aspect and uh, body language as well as the English. I mean, they both are kind of uh, partners to kind of bring out the best in a student. So, um, Adya ma'am, I would like to ask you, with so many campus interviews that you have conducted and you've come to our campus as well. So, during this recruitment process, during the selection of students, both for the industrial training and even otherwise, you know, for their final interview rounds and so on, uh, how important is it to be well-versed uh, in both these aspects? Because a lot of our students are at sea, you know, with the concept of what they, what are the, what is the panel looking for? So, could you throw some light on that, please? Yeah, I will. I mean, I like the fact that Sanchi brought out the, um, uh, uh, you know, the fact of confidence and, you know, it's not like a portion that you just, just give it to them. So, uh, in, in, so I find it extremely entertaining and I'm really sorry, but, uh, you know, students try so hard and it's such a sweet effort. They try so hard with their new blazers and their new, um, you know, trousers and their new skirts or their new saris and polished shoes and, and you know, they're stocking. And then, uh, like Sanchi said, they're like, you know, like a leaf in the wind, they're quivering. So one of the questions which I which I really like to ask is, have I grown horns and a tail? And they're so nervous that they don't even understand and then you know they don't laugh. So sometimes, you know, I was telling one of my colleagues that I feel like a circus master in the ring, like trying to entertain everybody and get them to to laugh or to smile. And then I see, you know, I say, Okay, well, you know what, take off take off your coat button and get comfortable. Uh, only the coat button and then they laugh. So when that laugh comes, then I know that at least we've got there like 40 or 50 percent. Uh, but I think that's that's a culture which which as hoteliers we've been brought up as, you know, to make everybody comfortable. And I'm not sure if I can say the same for other companies where they look at you and they immediately in seven seconds make an impression. You know, uh, we say that in seven seconds he made an impression and then he spoke. And then, you know, we all froze after that. That's a different story for another day. Uh, but seven seconds, I agree, seven seconds. And then after that, uh, that gives you a first impression. And then after that, it's completely how you conduct yourself. It's completely about the ability to have a conversation. So yes, uh, I agree with, with, I think, most of the panel members as well as what you're doing to the students. But it's yes. a combination, a perfect marriage uh, of both. Right. Right. You know, uh, so, you know, sometimes um, if I may just take a second more, I know like we're, we're on a time timer, but um, there are some people who show extremely high levels of confidence. But when they start talking, uh, we know that they haven't done the prep that is required to have that conversation. Right. And there are right. some students who are extremely underconfident or uh, they feel shy to have a conversation, mm -hmm. but they, some of those have, are extremely well uh you know, informed about where these things are happening in society. And then there is a combination. So we find all sorts of, uh, where, you know, permutations and combinations when we go to campuses. Uh, but, uh, but the polished shoes is a, is a sure, shine, you know, sure sign for us to start looking up to see, yes, is he a future hotelier with us? Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, Ashish, sir, I hope we have you back and uh, we are able to connect. Uh, is Ashish, sir? Uh, are you there? Yeah, I, I think yes. I think I'm audible now. Yes, Am yes. I... Thank you. Oh, lovely. I'm sorry, yes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what happened earlier. Yeah, but, no, uh... not a problem. <laughs> no, but yeah, so, Ashish, uh... what would you like to add to that, to what Ms. Adya said, you know, about the interview process? So the interview process for industrial training, uh, if, if you're specifically talking about industrial training, then yes, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's first of all, you know, it, it's an opportunity for all uh, we, we as a company what we try to do is we in, ensure that you know it's it's a personal interview and it's yeah. not like uh, just just a random group discussion where you have a few of them who are eliminated and then you know you only uh, get to meet a few of the students uh, we, we we definitely feel that everybody should be given a chance and then of course after that uh, you know then you decide who would actually fit uh, which particular brand of maybe the Marriott hotels and you know where they could actually work across different brands However, if, uh, if I have to look at communication in specific, yes, that is uh, the top priority. Uh, and then uh, the interview uh, is a very general interview, if you ask me, if, uh, if the student is able to make a conversation over, over, the, over the chat, uh, if he's actually able to convey uh, the message that he wants to convey. It's, it's never a technical round uh, that we're looking at. So uh, that's, that's something which is very secondary. 
okay. the primary aspect for us would be uh, basic communication that uh, you know he could talk about or she could talk about hobbies and interests and of course these days uh, there's a lot of focus on storytelling so is is he is he or she able to actually uh, you know uh, manage to convince uh, uh, the interviewer so that's that's another part of it as well uh, so yes uh, english uh, language speaking skills is what definitely is the focus uh, and yeah that's uh, there's a lot of uh, behavioral interviewing skills that we mm-hmm. look at these days we are sure. primarily looking at uh, attitude rather than uh, knowledge and skill so attitude plays primary importance here thank you thank you ashish um, and uh, keeping that in mind um, to uh, mr dale you know uh, dale sir we have uh, a lot of our first years in fact listening in today this webinar because in they are new to the industry they are new to the entire course and they are all so geared up to learning new things so uh, sir would you uh, like to give them a little more insights on the trinity exam especially the ones we conduct in the bcchs the gse examinations because we hope to continue that of course so i'm sure they would like to know a little more from you sir sure so actually maybe i should rewind and perhaps go back a little bit to what trinity believes rather yeah. than just focus on the subject so if you go back into our history we started in 1877 of course i'm not going to chronicle every year since then uh but um what i do want to add is that being a personal driven performance examination board we've always believed that you cannot slot anybody into a pre existing mold um so hence that means that you keep the test taker as we would call it at the center of any test taking ability and then you look to see whatever other construct needs to be added around them whether it's resources whether it's their abilities whether it's the context uh, and then have them really choose what to show which is a reflection of their best so which is why it becomes a very personal exam firstly um on the other scale of things um you know everyone today talks about the n derivative of subjects in fact about a month ago i did a webinar for about for teachers from about 34 countries and we were talking about education today is definitely not about your marks all right i mean just in this last year you will see uh we've had two extremes with state board results you've had the worst results in 12 years and then this year you've had the best results in 14 years so obviously we we cannot go by marks as any indication of what you can do um and what it really comes down to then is skills all right so it's not how much you know it's more of what can you do all right and even the time we're going through right now you see there are so many jobs which have kind of or people have um, lost their footing uh for the simple reason that are you or were you or will you be replaceable all right and the only way you'll never be that is if you can actually do something which someone else can't even including a, a computer so i think all of you over here are perfect examples of uh the reason why hospitality will always have that human touch is because that only people can do so that's the first and most important thing uh the second thing is i think when one looks at formation or person um and it's kind of come through from what everyone really on the panel has said is you're looking for that word which is called gravitas um or the wholesomeness of a person so it's not necessarily measured in the way they smile or the cut of the jaw or the cut of the suit it's measured in what does that person come to be to represent in those 7 seconds that perhaps you're sizing them up from the polished shoes to how deep is that mind that can really analyze interpret solve think critically make decisions and so on so for us even in the case of all our subjects whether it's language or whether we do actually have a dedicated communication skills syllabus including drama and all of those it's yes there is a proficiency in the subject and then there is a skill set that is developed by actually working through these different subjects so in the case with of uh, the the graded exams in spoken english or what we call jesse uh, that's a very simplistic 12 grade english speaking listening and interactive listening assessment uh, and the reason why we stand out from everybody else in the world when it comes to testing and specifically language testing is because of the interactive element we have examiners 
who will spend that personal time with you. It is not some tick box that you do on some kind of question which says, compare this picture with that picture and tell me five sentences. It is about you being able to show what you can do with your language functions. What can you do with your Lexus or your vocabulary, which is maybe off the trade. So it's all about what can you show us rather than having to study for something. And the graded exams in spoken English really give you the op opportunity to use English in an authentic way, an everyday way, which is, so you're again not making some sort of um, academic uh, presentation. You're quite possibly talking, if you were, let's say seven years old, you're gonna be talking about things in your room, in your house. Mm -hmm. If you are a little older, you're gonna be talking about maybe jobs and kind of work that people do. And at a higher level, you might be trying to make some sort of a persuasive argument because, for an adult, 90% of adult communication involves persuasion. I mean, there are three reasons why we communicate, which is either to inform or to educate or to persuade, or of course, to just entertain or to relate to. But for all of us who we use English and communication in our everyday lives, it's invariably being used to get someone to come around to your point of view and not just your point of view, because that would just be convincing, but to actually get them to do what you want them to do. And if you look at any organization, um, particularly the senior suite, however hard skill driven that the, the industry might be, the higher you go, the less your hard skills. Because in any case, you've got a fresh bunch who are trained to the T with newer technology and newer stuff. But it's finally the higher you go, it's your ability to work with people, to manage them, to uh, motivate them, to uh, guide them, um, and most importantly, to listen to them. So that is what our graded exams in spoken English do uh, not for almost every industry. I mean, I use it a lot since I have some element of connection with the financial services. I have mutual fund companies who would want to do this for their marketing teams. So again, not just because of the overt obviousness of communication and its importance, but also because of the subset of skills, what we refer to in today's terms as the 21st century skills or the soft skills or the transferable skills that we refer to. So in doing these exams, you are actually developing your ability to do a lot more, which can only be learned by doing, not by studying. So that's my real take on how this can, exam can help a lot of the students. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Mr. Dale. In fact, I would like to um, mention this at you know, this point uh, when you spoke about how it's not like a regular exam where you check a box or you write an answer. But the, uh, a lot of our students who have taken these exams with the international examiners who come to assess them, they actually come out of the examination room smiling and thrilled that they have given the exam. And that, that's very rare to see them go for an exam, you know, a little tense, but they come out, oh, wow, it was lovely. So um, it's a whole different experience. And that's what we even tell our students that it is not like a regular exam. You don't have to buy heart anything as such. You just have to be yourself and enjoy the examination process. So it's beautiful. The way a Trinity does conduct these exams is uh, absolutely a beautiful way to learn. So um, in fact, um, so thank you, sir, for that. Thank you very much for, you know, enlightening our students. Our first years, I'm sure, are looking forward to this process as well. Uh, I, fact, I, think, uh, I have one yes, request yes. <laughs> drop the sir bit. Oh, the Mr. Edwards bit, that was probably my father, just Dale is good enough here. <laughs> okay, thanks. All right, sure. Uh, coming to you, uh, Ms. Achi, uh, you know, uh, I have been on the same floor that you conduct your workshops uh, in the AV room. And um, honestly, there are times when I am standing quietly outside because it's, it's so interesting to watch all the students up and about and there's so much of that you know the buzz in the air is absolutely contagious so a lot of us stand out to see what's going on there you know and we are kind of missing out on the fun so uh, could you tell us and you know a lot of our listeners today on uh, what exactly uh, these uh, creative workshops are about and you know how do you get on with them so uh, you know i think uh, you know i'm so glad that uh, you know dale spoke to for me because uh, you know so many of my sentiments were echoed by what he just shared earlier you know uh, and uh, so these workshops are largely to do with, uh, like Annabel mentioned at the start of the session, also were about soft skills, communication, and the art of creating uh, that impression when you're interacting with someone for the first time. And uh, like Dale said, none of these can be academically taught. 
and uh, you know this is something that you can only they call transferable skills for a reason they you know because you only have to experience them hands on practically and only then you know what these skills are all about and uh, i'm not sure how many of us have actually been following uh, the new national education policy that was just uh, you know reformed and uh, after 34 long years and finally you know the government is uh, recognizing the need for these 21st century skills to be introduced in the academia today so we need we need our students to be more future ready we need our students to be more work ready we need our students to know how to handle themselves in various situations uh, in terms of how to communicate in case they stress you know conflict management you know how to be a team player how to ensure that your emotions are not overpowering your demeanor when it comes to you know conducting yourself in a professional manner so a lot of these areas are covered in the workshops that we do with the students and we're doing this pan india uh, you know uh, across schools across mm-hmm. colleges and uh, it is very exciting because you know every fresh set of students uh, you know there's a lot to take back in terms of what their mindset is also like and largely what i've seen is that the young adults today that i've been working with is very very worried about being judged they're very worried about you know what the other person is going to say and you know uh, about how they were and you know what they're going to think and how they're going to be perceived and i think that's where the confidence takes a little bit of a backseat you know because they're so worried about being judged and i keep telling them i keep telling them that life is too short to worry about what the other person is going to think of you you need to you need to ensure that you're putting your best foot forward no matter what you know and uh with, when it comes to soft skills when it comes to your communicative abilities when it comes to your eq uh, you know all of these things require a lot of practice so the fun and you know all of the hangama that you hear when you're outside of uh, uh, the room where we're doing the workshops is all about these yeah. practical exercises where the students oh. are actually put in practical situations in the form of case studies in the form of role plays where each at least 80% of the strength of the class uh, is given an opportunity to speak in front of the group and then they're getting real time feedback not only from me but from everybody who is participating right. that you know hey i think this bit of your body language could be a little better or maybe your tone when you're speaking could be a little better or hey when this situation happens maybe if you think of it in this way and conduct yourself in this way it's going to be better so this kind of an experience actually helps students far more tremendously than actually reading in a textbook saying communication is important because of xyz because these are the you know experiences and the learnings that they actually carry forward uh, and remember uh so that is uh, you know something that's very very important uh you know we actually focus on uh, you know the little aspects like body language uh you know the importance of your facial expressions your gestures you know for example uh, you know if 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 i tell a friend you know that hey i really like your dress and uh, you know i i say the same thing like hey yeah, i like your dress you know i'm going to be very suspicious of the second friend who's complimenting my dress because she's actually not complimenting my dress you know uh, and the reason is because there was disparity in what i was saying and what my face was conveying right uh, i may be saying the exact same words the exact same sentence but uh, you know my brain is like giving me this little red flag you know that she she doesn't mean what she says and why why is that happening that's happening because um, albert mehrabian this uh, very very famous uh, social psychologist i'm sure uh, you know the students are studying about him as well yes, yes. gave this communication model you know where your body language actually is the most important when it comes to communication because if there is a little disparity in what you're saying and what you're communicating through your body language your brain will only register what your body language was right. you can walk into an interview uh, you know you may be the best candidate you may be an mba from an ivy league you know everything on paper can be perfect about you but uh, if the interviewer sitting across you is asking you how you're feeling and you say you're feeling great but you have sweat trickling down your forehead and you're tapping your fingers on the table and you're fidgeting with your tie you're actually not feeling great and the interviewer knows that uh, right. you know so that's that's what soft skills is all about you know that's what your communication through your body language is all about and these these are some of the things that we explore through the sessions as well thanks thank you so much for that in fact uh, honestly i look forward to your workshop simply because i do a lot of this in theory but we do not get that much of time to you know kind of involve make an involved uh, practical session because of our syllabus and lectures so i i'll honestly tell my students listen you're going for the practical class and they wonder is it there for the exam do we have marks i'm like no sir no marks just enjoy the class you know but uh, thank you so much because it absolutely an add on to whatever we are trying to implement in college and with our subjects as well thank you for that um you. you're coming oh, yeah thank you i was wondering yeah. i was wondering why didn't the interviewer give him a hanky <laughs> so asking how are you <laughs> i mean it's obvious the poor thing is sweating <laughs> annabel who is this 
<laughs> in fact on that note uh, coming to uh, ms adhya and also to ms ashish you know uh, these courses it also comes with our certifications right uh, we have our trinity certificates um, even soft skills they come with a lot of valid certifications so adhya ma'am do you think that this makes a difference um, you know in terms of promotion of uh, students once they are in the industry and uh, you know probably even at entry level does this thing actually carry do the certificates carry weightage um, you know on their biodata do you look at that when they come for an interview or even for promotions later on so i tell a lot of my colleagues at work mm -hmm. that uh, they have to look at them as a product in the market uh, it's very sad but that's how with so many of us in our country striving to be in some best pockets uh, in the world we have to we have to start looking at ourselves as products and if we are a product then how are we upgrading ourselves so what is the version are they are 1 1.2 1.5 or whatever i'm not going to let that go of my age now but yeah 1.5 1.6 7 8 so if i have to keep updating and upgrading my versions uh, one of the ways to do it is education so any degree uh, in your pocket is a fabulous uh, you know it's it's a fabulous thing to have and also the fact is that you didn't let you know uh, rest on your laurels you kept investing in yourself just not with a college degree it could be a trinity degree it could be a uh, you know a nivel in 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 spanish it could be that you you're learning arabic or chinese because that's the next set of languages or it could be the fact that you know you're focusing on 3 to 5 indian languages itself um so not to digress from the point um uh, it is investing in yourself so if you if you if you think that that this degree is helpful which it is because as of now it is the widely spoken language and the official language of how we communicate in the world uh then that degree and if you feel that you want it then you have to subscribe for it so it's basically an upgrade right so yes i would i would recommend that the students have it uh thank you uh, ma'am uh, ashish mr ashish uh, what about you do you feel uh, this does have a you know kind of a boost to the students uh, cv and also probably later on while they are trying to move up the career ladder i think uh, like adhya mentioned it applies to everybody it's about enhancing your current uh, skill set so if uh, you know i need to enhance my current uh, skill set uh, mm -hmm. it could be even after 15 or 20 years of uh, you know experience in the industry uh, mm -hmm. uh, my current job uh, how am i going to enhance Uh, my current set of skills. Uh, it's mm -hmm. not only specifically for students who are freshers and who are who are passing out straight from college. Uh, we need to look at ourselves from time to time. So, uh, I felt I felt the necessity about uh, uh, you know after after moving into L and D, I felt the necessity to uh, to get some kind of exposure in human resources, and that's the reason uh, you know I I did take up a, I did take up a part time uh, program where where I had to attend class every Saturday and Sunday. So. i i did i did feel the necessity so then uh, that that's exactly the directive that comes to us in every organization i'm sure uh, right. and i don't see it only with myself or i also mm -hmm. see it with senior management you know who across uh, today uh, and they they're making the best use of this time uh, where uh, they are they're all actually if even if they're working from home or if they are currently coming into work at the hotel also uh, they are currently developing themselves that's what they are doing and i think that's right. uh, that's the key focus Right. Thank you. So, in fact, I think it's really important that the students today understand what you, you know. You both have just said because a lot of them believe they have got their graduation certificate, and so now they are sorted, you know, and now they are done, and that's this is it. This is the end, and now let's just go to work, and we'll get our salaries. But if I'm glad just... that this is come up. Yes, please. Yes, yes. No, no, no. If I could just add on because I suddenly remembered what Dave had yeah. said. Uh, it's great to have a degree, but. what trinity what he said that trinity offers is how we can persuade if you if i heard you right so the language is just not um just to be informed or to get educated in but also to persuade and in our line of work at the end of the day we are a business as well uh and we have to meet our uh, you know our our margins we have to persuade people to eat more than what is actually on their plate or persuade people to just say oh this is an ordinary room let's get a suite you know so the persuasion uh and and i i wouldn't use the word manipulative but in a way it is but it's a high level of persuasion which is an advantage uh negotiation between the guests as well as our colleague i mean as soon as you do that uh you become a hotelier you cross the other side 
so i think i think yes so dale said persuasion i think i believe i completely buy that absolutely thank you so they're able to persuade everybody dale <laughs> <laughs> i think i think there are some students who fell off the uh, the count <laughs> No, I think uh, you all are doing a very good job right now at persuading the students to get more than just a degree certificate because uh, that is ultimately the aim of you know having these workshops and courses. So that's 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 actually the main aim here. Uh, but you know, uh, coming to uh, students wanting to learn English and finding it difficult, um, Dale, uh, you know, you have uh, trained so many students and adults, um, you know, all over the place. institutes schools and so on what do you see as some of the roadblocks as in why do they find it so difficult to grasp the language or to even you know express themselves in a better way i mean what do you feel are some of the obstacles in their path so i think one of the primary challenges that we face in our country is what is the right methodology or what is the right pedagogy mm -hmm. um, for a lot of people you would see that they seem to think that english teaching or english learning is best developed by making you do coursework or by how which textbook you bought or by who wrote the book and the truth is um it first starts with your very classroom the classroom in which you teach english has got to be a communicative classroom so <clears throat> excuse me I, i'm not sure whether many would know this but uh between 2012 and 2017 we actually devised a subject called ASL which was assessment of speaking and listening for the entire CBSE board so we had about 17000 schools in india um develop this for children in grade 9 and grade 11 and we actually had to reengineer the way we approach teaching so for instance in india most of the classrooms the benches are bolted to the floor um there isn't enough of physical space uh the teacher to student ratio is off the charts the teacher talk time versus the student talk time is again off the charts because in india uh teachers talk 90% of the time and it's kind of funny because you're trying to actually build the child's english speaking ability which means that you really want him to be doing the talking or her to be doing the talking but you don't give them a chance so firstly i think we need to all of those things need to be put into place and they it's quite easily done uh um, we've done enough of work in this area uh to be able to help implement this with a lot of schools and that's what we continue to do the second thing i think is the way we approach it is you need to understand that while learning what we call l2 or your second language you there are going to be moments when there's going to be an inclusion of l1 elements all right uh we seem to love to say listen i want you to think in english yes but that can't happen when you're 20 years old it won't change overnight um so again it's the way in which you approach teaching the language and there i have to say that perhaps the best approach is the approach which is how much of it do you do every day in your life that's the way to teach it for instance um and you'll probably uh, see this mainly with schools with younger children parents will come on open house day and they'll ask you which phonics class should i sign my child up for and which vocabulary book should we buy them you never learn english that way i mean that's a con job and i honestly anybody who tells you that that's the way to do it have no clue about teaching the language all right because second language acquisition is a science in itself but most importantly the one thing to remember is that it will thrive if you try and use it mm. so we have the saying you know it takes a village to raise a child in much the same way when you speak english it's not just about what this one learner can do because he can't just learn it in his classroom and then go home and be surrounded by again the his native tongue and whatever yeah. so very often what we normally land up doing is you build the environment for language structure to happen so you set the scaffold you uh determine it in the case of an academic institution like you all have so you all know that fine these learning outcomes can be ascribed to this level and you have your learners work towards this but you also would know that the ones who are going to excel in english are the ones who are putting it into use every opportunity they get now again that sounds a lot easier than it really is because in india our homes normally have three generations there are quite possibly three languages in the house uh depends on which part of the city you live in and what socio economic structure you're part of all of these things do have a bearing 
But if you ask me, how do you overcome this? Is one, understand that language is driven by community. It is not you, not in isolation. It happens and it thrives and even more people use it, one. Two, and most importantly, let's assume that you are not in a situation where you have that construct or the surround support for that. Then the best way to do it is to actually work on it aloud yourself, all right, through a variety of ways. Fortunately, we live in technology-driven times. There are enough of tools online and resources online that can help you expand writing, that can help you to contract your writing, that can help you to build your listening skills and so on. So, uh, and I think technology to a great extent has been a fantastic enabler, particularly for children who may want to be that one from the first in, in from where they come. But other than that, I think also, at least in mainstream tier one, tier two, tier three, there is enough of an opportunity to help build the language. Uh, because even if it's an economic desire that drives a lot of students to learn it, all right, it has a certain amount of social or uh, a different value for the entire family to also be able to use the language. So in a lot of schools in Gujarat, when we are working with the kids, invariably the parents um, do not have no clue about English, we invariably will run a program all right, where the parents are also learning the similar kind of English that their kids are learning. So that when the kids go home, there's a continuity. And then the mother also feels great and the father also feels good that this is truly effective learning, which is affecting everybody. And honestly, that is, I think, when you make it less of a chore and more of an activity that you enjoy, that is how you're really going to help leverage that entire building process. So that's my um, thought on that. Thank you. That was uh, really extremely, extremely useful to us all, especially we as educators and, you know, helping a lot of our students who are coming from sometimes even vernacular backgrounds and finding it difficult. This absolutely makes sense on how we can practically implement, you know, a lot of these aspects in our regular teaching. In fact, a lot of our students who barely could speak, you know, three sentences uh, confidently in the first year, by the time they do come to the third year, are absolutely fluent. Uh, they feel so good about themselves. They are on stage at times and orating. You know, and it's lovely to see that transition and that growth. So, thank you so much, Dehra. Thank you for that. Um, you know, um, Sachi, you mentioned about our this generation, the fear of being judged. You know, and uh, they they wonder like what will happen. So, a little. Do you have some uh, kind of uh, words of advice and a little tips for a lot of our students who feel shy? I'm sure you have met many of them. And the shyness, how they say, no, we are, we are shy. We don't want to talk. So uh, any quick fixes, at least for, you know, a little bit so they can start working on it already. How do we overcome the shyness and nervousness? So as bizarre as it may sound, I actually used to be a really shy, uh, you know, school kid myself. You know, I would hate, uh, you know, coming out front and talking in front of a group or, you know, just interacting with someone who was not in my comfort zone. But uh, I think what definitely helps in, you know, overcoming that shyness is, uh, like Dale said, use every opportunity that you can to put yourself out there, you know, starting with, uh, you know, even simple things like, uh, you know, speaking in small groups, whether it's two, three, two people, three people, four people, get feedback on the way, you know, get out of that comfort zone. Uh, you know, that is something that definitely helps, you know, even today, before I take on whatever training or session or whatever talk that I'm going for, I always make sure that I rehearse. Because the more, uh, you know, the more effort I'm putting into in fine-tuning my script that I'm actually going to go out and speak, uh, there's less room for, uh, you know, me being nervous, me being less sure of what I'm going to say. So uh, even when you're doing online interviews for the students, uh, you know, not, not uh, all students can be camera friendly, not all students are, you know, uh, comfortable, you know, being on video. So in that sense, I, I recommend students to, you know, even do video chats with their friends where, they, where they're doing mock interviews. You know, the ones who are actually going for interviews, I tell them, get your friends on board, do a video call with them, do a mock interview, get your inhibitions and your shyness in front of the camera, get all of that out, and then you'll be good to go. The more you oil the wheel, the smoother the wheel is going to run. So the only way to overcome that shyness and that little inhibition is to just use every opportunity that you can to, you know, enhance your ability to speak to a group. Uh, you know, if you get the chance to be part of a public speaking competition, challenge yourself a little bit, go out there, practice, get help from your friends, from your family, 
uh, get feedback, use that feedback, uh, use that opportunity to put yourself out there and see what is the best that you can do. And like I always tell, uh, you know, all of the younger adults that I'm working with, don't feel afraid to make that mistake. Even if it's on stage and you goof up a little bit, you feel like your world is coming crashing down and oh my God, I'm going to be remembered for the rest of my life for saying this pronunciation wrong and for making this mistake. Nobody remembers and nobody cares. You make that mistake the moment you're out of, you know, you're out of their sight, you're also out of their mind. You know, it's only us who's creating those stories in our mind that they're going to remember me and oh my God, and you know, I'm going to be like this laughing stock for the rest of the college. It's really not going to happen. So the moment you, you know, get these thoughts out of your mind, you're automatically, you know, these inhibitions and these little, uh, you know, chains that we tie our thoughts with, the moment you start, you know, seeing yourself as those things, the moment you start getting more comfortable in your own skin, more comfortable with your own abilities, focus on things that are in your control, like, you know, practice what you're going to say, dress well, look good, feel good, you know, all of these things will automatically, you know, up your confidence a lot more. And uh, another thing, you know, when I'm conversing with people or, you know, whether it's an interview or whatever it is, another thing that really helps me uh, feel confident is when I know I'm making a connect with the person I'm speaking to. When I know that I'm breaking the ice and the ice is actually being broken, you know. So I always say that when you're going for an interview, do a little bit of background research if you can on who you're, who's going to interview you or the hotel that you're going know a little bit on the background and the history and you know all of that so when you actually touch upon some sort of personal chord with the person you're speaking with it goes a long way that person will automatically become a lot more warmer will become a lot more encouraging affirming and accepting of what you're saying and that automatically increases your confidence you know and if you don't know that person and there's very little information that you have about that person then throw in a little bit of small talk on current affairs or what's happening in the world and based on the response you get from the other person, you will know what kind of a person and what kind of mindset they operate with. Then you, you become the driver of the conversation. You know which way to take the conversation based on the responses you're getting from the other person. So that is also something that's very, very helpful. Uh, you know, it, it, it's like a little bit of a skill, you know, to, to gauge what the other person is saying or their, you know, from their body language. So, you know, through the workshops, we also tell students, you know, to notice on these little things. Right. You know, and pick on, pick on them and then take the conversation in that direction. You know, that is also something that's very important. And uh, uh, another thing that uh, Adya spoke about, you know, the ability to persuade, uh, you know, that is also something that comes with practice, you know, the confidence to persuade, the confidence to uh, get someone to actually notice what you're saying and take it into account and take it seriously is again something that comes with practice. So another thing that I really recommend students to do is have an elevator pitch. Uh, ready for yourself, you know. Uh, it's something that they do in a lot of these schools, uh, you know, where you have 30 seconds in an elevator with a person and in those 30 seconds you have to tell them that person will give you a job. So what are you going to say, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, doing these little exercises for yourself uh, is something that really, really has helped me personally a lot. I know it's helped a lot of the students that I've done these workshops with. Uh, and I ensure that before I'm leaving that session, all the students attending have their elevator pitches ready, you know. So even when, when we do them with John Boss for the students, uh, you know, you're going to meet the, the manager of this hotel. 30 seconds, you have to convince them what you're going to say, you know. Uh, so these, these little exercises uh, definitely, you know, really help students. And uh, just, you know, as much as you practice, you know, whether it's in front of a mirror, whether it's taking videos of yourself, these are little things that, can, you know, as, as silly as they may sound, they actually really, really help. Can I just weigh in on this yes. one, please, Alenka? Um, yes, yes, please. Uh, so uh, there is a, um, um, a, well, a doctor and a psychologist. His name is James McCroskey. And in the 1980s, he came up with something known as the PRCA, which is your personal report of communication apprehension. So the term that we normally refer to as shyness is actually termed as uh, communication apprehension. And you can download this and it'll be great for you to even use with your students because uh, it has 24 questions over there. And it's not just about your apprehension to communicate. We normally associate uh, shyness in the context of public speaking, perhaps. But you'd realize that sometimes one may be very happy to do the public speaking bit, but may not be so comfortable to perhaps uh, evaluate uh, or hold the same comfort in, let's say, a group conversation. Or someone may be very good with a dialogic kind of thing with just mm -hmm. two people, but the minute it moves to a group uh, dynamic, they struggle. So there are two parts to this. One is um, you can download this. It's called a PRCA score. Um, and it tells you how to tabulate it. Uh, and this whole thing was coined by James.
McCroskey. Uh, but the second thing that I want to address is how and why does the feelings of shyness come about? So firstly, how do we attribute it or how do we say that I'm feeling nervous? If you ask most people, they normally will talk of symptoms. They'll say, well, I don't know, when I stand on a stage, my legs start quivering or I go dry in the mouth or uh, I start sweating or I feel butterflies in the stomach. Now, there is a completely legitimate scientific explanation to all of this. And um, that explanation basically says very simply that the minute your body is in a state which it is not accustomed to, your nervous system immediately senses that, and all of this is happening in split, split seconds, and is kind of trying to help you adapt with that situation. And the way it's gonna try and make you adapt with that is by trying to have additional oxygen reach all parts of your body. And the only way that can happen is by pumping blood faster. Um, and this feeling is very similar to when you have an adrenaline rush. You know, you just don't, you can't calm down because your body is so excited because your, your nervous system has sensed that you are about to go on stage. It's helping you stay more awake by pumping that additional blood supply. But because you don't understand that, you think, um, oh, uh, and particularly at that time, if you're stationary, your legs will start shaking because that additional blood supply is going out. And if you do not ease it by taking a step or two, you're going to continue to feel this even more. The same thing with when you've just eaten something, all right, and uh, to prevent you from falling asleep, that additional blood supply through the stomach causes a tingliness, which is similar to what we call butterflies in the stomach. These are scientific explanations to what most people manifest as um, symptoms of shyness or symptoms of fear. And I think if we wrapped our head around it and understood what was happening to our body, and the next time it did happen, and were able to break it down and say, oh, okay, someone has told me what is happening over here, and this is now what is happening, then slowly your fear of this will also dissipate, and you'll say, okay, fine, I now know that I'm on familiar ground because I know what's happening to me. So this, I thought, is important to understand it because um, most people will normally uh, talk about exercises, but I think it's also good to know how the body functions in moments like these. And this is purely scientific. It's not my take. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, to use the PRCA score with your students to be able to tell who are the ones who would are naturally predisposed to perhaps feeling a little bit of anxiety or um, apprehension in which scenario. There are four different scenarios that you can break it down through this score. Wow. Truly, this is something we are definitely going to read up and implement because absolutely insightful and PRCA. So we've got a lot of reading to do over the weekend and that's what we're going to do. Uh, thank you uh, for that, Dale. Uh, we are nearing the end. I know we are running a, a tight clock here when you're in the end of our webinar. But uh, before we end, just a little bit um, on not only English, but even in, in general, a foreign language. Uh, Mr. Ashish, uh, would you care to, you know, uh, probably tell our listeners today, do you think it's important to also probably learn a foreign language and would it help the entire process in kind of uh, streamlining their careers and help them move ahead? Hi, Dalia. Yeah. Uh, so oh. foreign language, do you think you would recommend our hospitality students to study that? Um, Ashish, sir, would you? Of course. Uh, why not? Uh, because uh, like we just spoke about earlier, uh, you know, anything, anything that uh, is pertaining to self-development, anything pertaining to, uh, you know, enhancing your current set of skills uh, definitely helps. Um, and I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Adya spoke about it in the first part as well, uh, where uh, the current set of guests in hotels, mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, you have those set of travelers uh, who just not here as tourists anymore. And uh, they, so this kind of an additional, uh, you know, uh, foreign language that I would know or one of the students would know, uh, there's always a connect with those kind of guests uh, because all across today, it's all about a connect. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's where, uh, you know, we have uh, more and more repeat guests coming back to our hotel. Uh, like the, we, we did speak about EQ as well some time back. So uh, today it's uh, more about connecting with your guests and that kind of a relationship that builds across uh, for us to get back all our 
clients back to our respective hotels now uh, so it's definitely a, it's definitely a value add on to any student uh, i think to each one of us uh, so yeah uh, and uh, you know it, it it helps overall tomorrow i want to take up uh, take up something else in my career also it would it would be a value add on right thank you thank you sir um we do have french as well with our english classes so that's what they are learning but of course it's the basics a lot of them do go on to probably pursue a higher level so yeah i mean thanks for that it definitely kind of helps them to understand the importance of you know equipping themselves with more than a language so thank you sir um are there ma'am any um, you know thoughts for students now on the threshold of their careers a lot of them are now beginning to uh, kind of step into the industry and any words of advice for them ma'am um yes you know um definitely because i work with such a beautiful company called the tatas so um one of the main reasons why ms tata also built hotel is to showcase the epitome of hospitality so we as our culture itself uh gives a lot in terms of how we look after people so we shouldn't lose that you know we can learn as much as we can which is through degrees and through uh, various experiences but the essence of hospitality shouldn't be lost so you still have to have that human touch uh, we still have to be extremely humble we have to showcase all our values we have to uh, we have to have that sense of you know atithi devo bhava it will always be there that is that is uh, in the truest sense uh, the spirit of hospitality of our country and one of the reasons um, many hotels are also investing in our country is because of this you know the the kind of the kind of people who are hired even the nannies you know in the united kingdom half of them are from asia that's because of the the love that they have or the care that they have i lose butlers every year i lose about 20 to 30 butlers every year for, to cruise liners is because of the sense of hospitality and the kind of service that you know our colleagues give or or rest of my country gives so uh, having said that uh, this is one thing which which we look at i mean apart from the language apart from uh, you know sanchi and dale are making our tough our job really tough now on campus by upgrading all, all the students but this is what we'll always look for uh, we'll we we'll look for this essence and that's one thing which the students should you know they shouldn't get uh, they shouldn't forget that you know the smile uh, the respect uh the the value of responsibility uh in this particular age we sh- we see that you know slowly uh how would i say bleeding away the responsibility aspect highly responsible so uh wh- you know we did a study as to why uh probably responsibility you know is much lower in the current generation uh, that's probably because uh, the both the parents are working and uh, the student the, the child is by himself or herself at home and tends to uh, you know grow up on his own or her grow up by herself uh, and she is left to or he is left to technology to look after so uh, there was a time when you know uh, when my sister and i were given chores so when my mom was cooking i had my mom used to wash the vessels i had to wipe it my sister had to keep it so at a at a very young age we were taught responsibility which i think is currently missing and that's very it it reflects a lot in 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 the work that we do because communication when a guest communicates to you uh, there's a lot of saying that goes that indians uh, love to say yes but are not efficient enough so we we'll have to and it's a very it's very sad thing to do because they're wonderful they they're fabulous people however you have to ask them four times uh so they and they also attributed it to us not understanding the language which is not the case it's just that we haven't communicated back we feel that we'll finish everything and then we'll tell them or it's understood that we will do it uh we have to communicate back so this is these are the two things which i'm definitely going to uh, you know say that this is a this is like a cheat sheet for everybody because sanjay and they have already had now all the loopholes that we look at uh but essence of hospitality of our country one and the second is responsibility wow thank you that was beautifully uh, put if together if i could just yes. chip in just so that adhir does not um, knows yes. that we are on her side um <laughs> so the taj is a particular as an example all right is firstly i think the as she rightly put it the epitome of um definition of high standard um and i and i say this not because of 
charming properties, which of course are in itself a world apart, but also because of the team that runs the entire organization and every person that mans every door or every bellhop that I've encountered. Um, just so that you know, Adia, we, we do about 5,000 room nights with you all as Trinity. Yes. All examiners stay with you all. <laughs> Um, I was being extra nice to you. <laughs> and, and of course, we, um, and also to, to go back, I mean, in one of our education projects, we've been working with uh, another platform uh, from the Tata group. Um, and at the highest level, there was some discussion about a lot of your team doing Trinity assessments, particularly with communication skills um, and so on. So um, more than ever, I mean, you, for a lot of the younger ones who are going out there, I firstly think that Indians are predisposed to hospitality. Um, it's in our genes, it's in our culture, it's in our nature. Um, aside from that, I also feel that uh, different organizations have taken it and made it a hallmark. Uh, the Taj is certainly one of them. Uh, JW is also certainly one of them. I can say that because a lot of our Bombay examiners stay at the JW. Um, and it's what uh, organizations and what people like yourselves do with your teams that really raises that benchmark to, to perhaps the highest levels ever. Um, so for a lot of the youngsters, I think finding an organization is one part of it, but finding an industrial house who values these things over the long run is honestly going to be your bigger challenge. Um, I mean, there are a lot of likenesses drawn between some of our top corporate houses in the country. And then of course, when you really get to the core of it, perhaps all of them fall away uh, and it's just one or two names that are really left. And those one or two names uh, are because of the value that they place to the human capital. And do not forget that they got there also because of the human capital and the experiences that were built along the way. So for a lot of the youngsters, I would say, you know, stick in there, find a good organization that values people. In fact, as per the LinkedIn survey of 2020, uh, the top trending item this year is uh, employee uh, engagement. So gone are the days where you just had to go and uh, you know try to get into a good company. Today, companies are also looking at the reverse and rewarding good people and trying their level best to engage and keep motivated their best and their brightest. Thank you. Thank you for that, Amina. It's beautiful how everyone everyone seems to just tie up everything together and it all comes together so beautifully as one fantastic uh, communication package, if I may say so. Um, we are now at actually one of the important parts of the webinar and that is the open forum. So uh, if there are any questions from our listeners, any or, or the students who are watching, listening, do we have any questions you would like to ask the panelists? Please feel free to um, type in the question in the chat box or we will read it out and we will answer it. The panelists will answer it. Uh, before we, uh, sorry, Alenka, before we open yes, yes. it, I just would like to say two things. One is, Adia, I know you're time bound and you have something at, uh, uh, that you need to uh, go for so that I don't lose you and want to thank you for, for taking the time to uh, spend with the students and interact with our panelists. And, uh, uh, you know, at any point of time, I know I have called you it has always been we have connected and i know that uh, you know you have always made our students feel so uh, comfortable during their interviews and that is uh, a, a test a testament to your communication skills there's no question about that and i really and truly appreciate it uh, this one question to all the panelists i heard this one word which to me uh, uh, growing up in bombay and then having lived in the states and then returned back uh, I do find that there is a different dialect, unfortunately, that I've been uh, hearing since I came back. How do I get the students to have a neutral accent? Because, uh, you know, my business, when I was in the States, I realized that people overall have very impatient with an accent they cannot understand. And when you come to a hotel in India and you have all these different accents at you, uh, 
you know, to to as much as we may sensitive, you know, uh, I guess tell the guest and kind of educate them about our different accents. I find some of them extremely difficult to understand as an Indian. So how do we get to this neutral accent? Or what is, a, yeah, please. If I may just come uh, in yeah. now, sorry. Yeah. So going forward, uh, we do not want to neutralize the accents as an industry because okay. we want to showcase the culture, which is flavored with all these accents, if I may put it. Okay. How do I understand? We just have to speak extremely slowly. Uh, okay. we, have to, we have to pace our words. And okay. what happens is it, it, it automatically, I, I'm, I'm not sure the science behind it, but apparently we start lip reading. So when we okay. start getting into the lip reading and when you get comfortable with the person, you automatically have a connect. And when you okay. have a connect, you start lip reading. So therefore you tend to understand. And as Sanchi was saying that uh, one of the best hotels in the world, which is Mandarin Hotel Oriental, uh, sorry, Mandarin Oriental, yes, Mandarin Oriental uh -huh. in Bangkok, all of them speak, they do not speak English. None of them, okay. except probably for three or four of them in management. The people who deliver the service do not speak the language. If you go to Venice in Italy, they only speak Italian. Uh, the, the, the Palazzo in, in Venice, they only speak Italian. If you go to, uh, if you go to St. George's in uh, St. George Paris, I mean in Paris, they only speak French. Uh, so whatever you speak, it's the ability to persuade. It is the ability to show that you care. It's the ability okay. to give that thing that they want immediately. Um, I wouldn't worry so much about uh, the dialect or the accent, a uh, okay. dialect, but uh, uh -huh. maybe we could, um, just give me a minute, maybe we could uh, ask them to speak probably a little slower. That would Slow. probably help, okay. yes. Thank you. Uh, anyone else that would be able to give us any uh, kind of, so slower is one. So, um, so from a perspective of um, producing sound in the context of what uh, the mouth, um, so this entire region over here is known as the mask. And speech is really produced when you, it's a combination of the way your lips, your teeth, and your breathing function. And on that basis, then you have sound that comes out and the fin final production and the rounding off of sound comes really from the movement of the lips. Now, if you understand that most of your, or your entire mouth or this entire region is controlled basically by muscles, um, English, obviously being English, if it's your native language, then they, you're predisposed to using those muscles already. But if for instance, let's say you're speaking another language, uh, it could even be French or it could be Tamil. Uh, the muscles over time develop in the way in which you speak most. That does not mean that it cannot be unlearned. It only means that it's a physical process of two things. One is stretching and loosening those muscles. Two is being able to keep in mind what are the key phonetic pronunciations, the 44 sounds that the English language has and being able to articulate those. So if someone is able to understand the sound that it is able to make, then they can attempt to do it and it will become easier when the muscles of the mouth are a little looser. Um, I do know that in India, there is a separate industry that calls themselves voice and accent trainers. Um, and there again, I, I, I want to uh, probably uh, hold dear to what uh, Adia mentioned is that I think we need to also respect our individuality and not necessarily be aping everything that comes out of the West and certainly not American English because it's, that's just it. It's American. It's not even English, you know? So I think one needs to just be true to try and find firstly their best ability to get to the actual phonetic sounding um, ability to then be able to get your actual pronunciation in line with what you want. Certain things like a heavy tongue of a certain accent will probably take a lot of work and may never go away. But right. it's that when you counter that with a slower delivery speed, 
um, will certainly help in being more articulate, even if it means that your tongue will be thicker on certain words. But again, the mask can be worked on because it's muscles, all right? Keeping the phonetic sounds as the standard to work towards in terms of being able to produce those sounds will be a step closer to being able to develop as close to a neutral accent that you would like. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions by the students? Students, if you are interested in asking any questions, please switch on your mic and you could ask the question. All are overwhelmed. Okay. I think uh, there are no questions for now. Hello, ma'am. Yes. yes. This is Mark here. Yes. As Sanchi ma'am said that uh, talked about elevator talks. Can we get yes. an elaboration or an example of what we could do if we are in that situation? Uh, so Mark, that's uh, actually a very, very interesting question. And uh, that's something that, uh, you know, uh, all of the students really enjoy putting together their elevator pitches. So elevator pitches typically, uh, you know, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be 30 seconds of you in an ele elevator with somebody. It doesn't literally mean that. What it actually means is uh, you need to have a short introduction for yourself uh, that's ready at any time that is so strong and so impressive and highlighting all your strength areas that the person you're communicating with uh, wants to know more and wants to give you the opportunity to interact with you more so that there is a prospective hire that can be made. Uh, so the idea of an elevator pitch is largely uh, you know, when, when you're interacting with a person who doesn't have too much time to get into a detailed conversation, but through that pitch, you actually, you know, you could actually score a meeting with them or you could, you know, probably they, they may say that, here's my card or here are my contact details, let's catch up, uh, you know, some other time, I'd love to know more about you, I'd love to know more, more of what you have to offer. Uh, so 30 to 40 seconds of an introduction where you talk about your name, uh, a little bit about your strength areas, what you're good at and why that person should give you time, why that person should notice you. Uh, so that's what an elevator pitch is all about. And uh, okay, what what, uh, what your interaction with them uh, can help them with. How, how can they benefit with knowing you, with interacting with you, and how can their organization benefit, uh, you know, with having you? What is so special about you? So that is also something that your elevator pitch should highlight. Can I take a stab at this as well? Yeah, please, please. Go ahead. All right. So if you don't mind, I'm going to share my screen. All right, because coincidentally with my batch that I'm working with a little later this evening, um, I'm dealing with this in the context of um, persuasion, which is really what an elevator pitch is all about. All about. I'm going to share with you a little bit of a formula over here. Um, we, I call it the six step uh, process, if you can see this over here. So let me just put it to you very simply. You can see on the left hand side, the different boxes of what you're required to try and achieve. Um, now, the best way to do it is to do it fast. So starting with step one, which is right at the bottom, all right? If you see over there, it's written, what is the call to action? Or what action do you want someone to take when you're making your pitch? So you jot that down right at the bottom of the page, all right? So let's say I want you to donate five rupees to uh, feeding um, uh, poor children or stray animals. Um, Thereafter, I go straight into step two, which is above that, which is what's in it for them. Why should your audience want to do this for you? All right. Or what will they benefit? So maybe if I be using that same example of donate five or 10 rupees for stray dogs, it would be the fact that you helped uh, take care of a stray animal that perhaps today would have gone hungry. All right. Um, so you fill in point two over there. And then above that is point three, where you give them three basic ideas in just one sentences that explain why they should do it. So they should do it maybe because it's the right thing to do, because if they don't do it, that poor dog is not going to have something to eat or one other reason. And then above that, you take those same three ideas and you flesh them out with three sentences each. And you finally come to number five, where you recap it with another one sentence to 
uh, finish off each of your main ideas. And then finally, you think of how you're going to get their attention to get that conversation started. So this is a six step process that we use. Um, in between, you can see I used words like transitions over there. That's basically how you're going to bridge. So you might want to use a story. You may want to use some humor. You may want to use an anecdote. You may want to use a quotation. Those are the linkages that help you navigate this entire six step process. So you prepare for it from step one at the bottom going upwards. But when you start to deliver it and talk to per the person, you start from point number six and come down. So you finally close with what's in it for them. Sorry, I just happened to have this slide handy because it's in my presentation. Fantastic. So that's why I thought I would share it with you. So that's brilliant. Thank you. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Uh, Thank by you the so way, much, the, the, this is Mark, who uh, is our first year student, who has come in uh, at 94% from his 12, with his 12 standard. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yes, so we have a lot to look forward to with Mark. Mark, your, your seniors would have done a lot of elevator pitches with me, so you can ask them uh, for help. <laughs> okay, <laughs> ma'am. How, how you must put your pitch together. Sachi, you're definitely coming back to, to, to do stuff with Mark and the, his batch. That's for sure. <laughs> it's Absolutely. just a question so, of being, uh, you know, being uh, present physically in Don Bosco, hopefully, when this <laughs> entire I'm pandemic... Waiting, I'm waiting to... I, I was even telling Andre sir the other day that I'm waiting to actually come and eat. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> all, all of the treats that you have. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to come back to this one question because it, it bothers me a lot when it comes to when we were talking about, uh, and Ashish, if you're, if you're there, uh, let's say, for instance, you have a student who you're interviewing and uh, the student says uh, hotel instead of hotel, uh, executive instead of executive, and determine instead of determine. Is that not something that is a little jarring or is it not something, I, I, I mean, we are leveling all the other uh, playing fields, which means that the student is well-groomed, he has all his technicals, he's, uh, uh, you know, has done well, uh, he's ready for the interview. But while he's speaking, these certain things tend to come in. Does that make a difference? Sorry, Ashi. Annabelle. Uh, if I, yeah. I, I did, I did get a uh, one part of the question. Uh, may I request you to have uh, that? Question? Yeah, sure. So sure. the idea is, uh, you know, we we have the level playing field. Uh, you have two, let's say, two uh, different candidates. Both have fantastic basic skills. They know their technicals. They have done well. Uh, they are well groomed. They both are in the same category as far as presence of self. But one person uses the word. A uh, hotel instead of hotel, uh, executive instead of executive, uh, determine instead of determine. Isn't that, does that bother you as an interviewer in placing them or in accepting them as an asset for your team? Uh, so, uh, you know, you, we've always uh, noticed uh, a lot of uh, people having different styles of pronunciation. Now, uh, in this case, uh, it, it it does not it does not necessarily bother us uh, you know with regards to the selection criteria if you ask me uh, okay. because uh, it's it's not the only criteria just for you know a few words that this person is uh, is right enunciating uh, right now uh, in this case uh, you know like I said earlier uh, for us se uh, selection criteria I'm sure it's for most hoteliers and for most organizations as well as on today. Uh, it's more to do with the attitude, uh, you know, and then right. we, uh, we're here to develop, uh, you know, the skill set over a period of time. Right. Uh, and then uh, I may I may have, you know, a person who's applying for, uh, not necessarily for the front of the house, or right. uh, let's let's talk about front office or an F and B service kind of a uh, kind of a discipline. In this case, uh, you would notice it with maybe a culinary person, you know, who's not always uh, using a correct pronunciation. Uh, so yes, uh, however, that does not stop us from hiring them uh, because at the end of the day, uh, and in fact, it's, it's, it's very evident these days, uh, 
the culinary experts also are part of a show kitchen. They are part of a right. Kitchen. They're interacting with guests. Uh, in fact, after they are hired, uh, it's 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 our responsibility as L and D professionals uh, to be uh, you know taking care of their development as well. Now, what we do with them uh, is uh, as a part of the soft skill training. Uh, we we do uh, we do a lot of uh, basic English sessions with them, uh, where they can handle and manage certain basic questions that you know a guest would ask them. Uh, right. Sometimes sometimes it's a script that we need to provide them with, uh, and then of course. So this is this is very shop floor uh, specific training. Uh, okay. Bring how the volume of operations is. Uh, you need to pull them out of the operations and you know take them into uh, take them into a classroom for about one hour and and then after that you know uh, give them these kind of situations where they are actually uh, made to understand that how they would actually speak when they have guests of different nationalities across that that they are dealing with. Um, oh. So yes, it's not it's not that you know if if I'm hiring a person at that point of time and you know there's this kind of a pronunciation that I notice that I'm going to outright. Uh, Reject the candidate. That that's not the case. Uh, so yes, uh, okay. in fact, uh, we also do a lot of these English speaking uh, sessions for uh, housekeeping associates because you know that's where we notice that uh, uh, that there is always a gap in uh, the way they would convey convey across to guests. Uh, so yes, uh, and this is the best time. If you ask me today, there is so much of time on us, and the volume of operations is not huge. Uh, we we actually are investing a lot into training associates, uh, you know, getting them up to speed. Uh, just because uh, hopefully by uh, mid November, you know, uh, we 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 should be back to back in business in the way it should be, uh, considering that's the season for hotels. Uh, you know, by then we'll we'll get back to operations. But now this point of time, uh, we're actually spending a lot of time training and you know developing these. Wow! Thank you, thank you so much. That is, you know, uh, two things. I, I'm absolutely uh, thrilled that you have the positivity that we are going to get back because our students and especially our graduates who, you know, already had their jobs and and now are kind of waiting tenuously to figure out what's going to happen next. Uh, so I appreciate that positivity, uh, Ashish. Truly. I also, I also, uh, Annabelle. I like what uh, Sanchi mentioned uh, when she while she was speaking about. Uh, uh, the ability to practice and rehearse is so important, uh, you know, for for everybody. Uh, even, even for me today, if if you mm -hmm. ask me, uh, you know, uh, I would rehearse before before if I'm walking across for a presentation, I would rehearse. So it's important right. for each one of us, you know, and and knowing knowing your audience also at the same time on the other side, uh, you know, uh, knowing the background of the audience, doing some research before actually going across and and speaking. Uh, it matters because there could be a situation where uh, you know there's a complete silence in the room, and I need to I need to break open the conversation. Uh, so that does matter. Uh, so yes, uh, I think some great uh, takeaways over over the chat that we've had, uh, and I, it should yeah. be it should be a lot of takeaways for the students rather. Right. Absolutely. I mean, I I um, I think I filled as as all my uh, staff know. I filled about seven pages here as I'm talking to y'all. Uh, which then will translate to the students. I'm, uh, I'm going to share my I'm going to share my uh, communication apprehension score with uh, Dale after. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to do that. <laughs> and that's something we are definitely the way, all going to be doing. By the way, yes. I must tell you this. Um, I know Ashish said that he knows me from school, and I got to be honest. When I came on, I still did not place him. All right, but two minutes later, I now know who he is. <laughs> so if I can did you do a, did you do a quick Facebook search? <laughs> oh, there was something I you know when I saw Ashish's photograph in the flyer, all right. So I actually know Ashish's brother is my batchmate, all right, and I know Ashish. Uh, so his brother and me were at school from grade one together. So I literally know Ashish probably from the age of he's probably been three or four years old, <laughs> right. right? I haven't seen him maybe in about twenty years, all right. So. Um, uh, so, which is why it took me a little while. In fact, the pet name that he was known in the family and the home was Chinu. So that I, I mean, <laughs> that's what comes to me after all these years. You've just, you've just announced it all over. <laughs> <laughs> what, the, what the heck? Yeah. 
but yeah, I mean, so that's how well I know Ashish. It, it, it took me a little while, but I mean, I'm so happy really that I've connected with him because um, I was really close to his family and uh, mum and brother and dad and everybody. That is amazing. Uh, and now there's another connection, right? Just by knowing them. Our six Absolutely. degrees of uh, connection and separation are all to do with Don Bosco. Absolutely. <laughs> are there any other students that would like to ask a question? Okay. Um, come oh, yes, we've got someone. Yes. Uh, uh, a very good afternoon to all the guests uh, here, uh, Ma'am Annabelle and Ma'am uh, yes. Elinka, Ma'am. Uh, so, my I have actually two questions. Uh, one is for Mr. Uh, Dale and another is for Mr. Uh, Ashish. So, first, uh, I would like to go with uh, Mr. Dale. So, I have heard that in order to study, in, study abroad, we have to uh, sit for the IELTS. We have to prepare for that. So, my question is, what is the weightage of Trinity? grade six or nine uh, in front of the IELTS? Okay, so that's a brilliant question. So if anybody is going abroad to study, uh, the first thing that they require for anybody coming from India is that you show that your English use, not just in speaking and listening, but in reading and writing is also there. All right. So the kind of exam that currently Don Bosco is doing is only in speaking and listening, okay? It is not comparable with the IELTS exam because the IELTS exam is for all the four skills, okay? However, we do have an exam which is known as the integrated skills in English. In fact, that's the most, that's actually the leading English exam in the world for any sort of advanced higher study including things like migration purposes and visa purposes and all of that. That's the exam that normally everybody does. So the Jesse exam or the speaking and listening exam <clears throat> is not, will not be the right one to do if you're looking at going abroad to study. Uh, because there, the, the university or the college that you're going to want to know that not just can you speak and listen, but can you also read and write in English language? So there you need to do a four skill exam. Trinity does offer that. We do have a lot of uh, colleges in India that do this exam. And depending on which university you are going to, if you do the ISE exam, you may not need to do the ILTS exam because we carry the same amount of weightage. If you are going to the UK, then probably about 98% of British universities recognize Trinity's ISE exam. All right, but it depends on where you're going. Um, certain universities have a preference. Um, in any case, I mean, if you ever need help to figure out whether are you, um, ours is covered by whatever your university is, you can check and then write in or ask Elenka ma'am or Annabelle ma'am, and I'd be happy to help you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Dell. Uh, my next question is uh, for Mr. Ashish. Uh, so uh, being a training manager and uh, everyone is afraid uh, about the what of future holds, especially the hospitality students. And uh, what uh, I would like to ask you that uh, what is uh, your uh, uh, thinking about that? Is there is uh, any method that is going to change after this pandemic or due to this pandemic, or uh, how are you going to conduct the training and the recruitment? Wonderful. I was actually going to talk about this, uh, and you know. Um, I think Adya touched upon uh, a few basics that don't change. And while we were we were appreciating and talking about uh, the Tata Group and uh, the way uh, the hotelier lifestyle is, uh, so you know when uh, when some of the key elements that we look for in a hotelier, like humility, does not it, it, it it's it's important. It's a part of our business, and that's something which would never change. Uh, the current situation. Uh, if I have to be very honest, as on today, um, we're very confident that things would change, things would bounce, I mean, business would bounce back. Uh, we're looking at, uh, of course, it, it's going to take time uh, because we're already noticing that business trends have dropped 
drastically for this year. Uh, but we are very, very optimistic and positive about it that uh, in the next couple of months that we can see hospitality booming the way it used to be. Uh, and of course, I think for each one of you, uh, that's, that's uh, at this point, uh, you should not really get worried about it and hassled about it. Uh, you need to stay very positive. That's one. Uh, secondly, uh, be focused with if, if you're interested in culinary, if you're interested in f &B, if you're interested in front office, uh, whichever stream that you're interested in, I think, uh, you know, just be focused. Uh, look at developing yourself with whatever time you have on hand at this point of time. Uh, you can make use of, could be through online courses and whatever you wish to do, something that you'd like. Uh, the market, the way we look at it, would definitely pick up. And it's not too far. Uh, so. We're very optimistic that, you know, by, let's say, somewhere mid-November, we at least see the business uh, getting better. At this point of time, uh, we, we just, uh, we've kind of streamlined our operations. Uh, we've, uh, we've got a lot of initiatives, a lot of new cleanliness initiatives that have come in. So not only for guests, for associates as well. So it's not only that, you know, these kind of uh, new initiatives that have been rolled out uh, is primarily only for guests. Uh, even for people who work within hotels, considering that you have a large workforce, uh, these kind of initiatives is very important or these kind of new standards that we've set in amongst our hotels is very important for the safety and security of our associates also. So uh, that's taken about two and a half months, if you ask me, uh, at least in my hotel, we've taken about two and a half months to get things in order. Now, uh, I, now we've got used to it. So this is the new normal. We call this the new normal. Uh, our whole style of doing business or the entire hoteliering standards have changed over the last two and a half months. Uh, even if I'm eating in the cafeteria today, uh, I'm, I'm conscious about the number of people who are dining on my table. So we've, we've kind of realigned, restructured, redesigned part of the house as well as front of the house. So it's an interesting time to be a part of this business because I have. Uh, let's say, along with me, there's a whole lot of senior leadership, the management across, we've all learned a new way of actually leading this new normal. And we're gradually getting uh, associates who are sitting at home all this while, we are gradually getting them back to hotel. So if I had about 50 people who are working until last week, today there are about 150 people who've been called back to work. And as business grows and it gets better, uh, since standards have already been set across, we're very confident of calling the others back as well. Of course, uh, you know, some have a few travel restrictions. So we don't see, uh, you know, the day, I mean, not too far off when I could have all 300 or 350 associates getting rostered across the hotel. So that's not too far. And uh, automatically, business sets in, you know, uh, youngsters and freshers like each one of you who are getting out of college also. Uh, we have pre-opening hotels also, which are in the pipeline. Uh, work hasn't stopped. So if today, if you tell me there's a pre-opening hotel, which is let's say like a, a Western hotel, which is opening in Goa, uh, we've already started hiring for those set of hotels, right? So the senior leadership is already on board. So that means somewhere we're very optimistic about the way business is going to pick up over the coming months. And I think that's where each one of you need to be very, very positive and feel good about the fact that, you know, uh, the kind of change that you're going to witness in whichever hotel or whichever organization you are in tomorrow, you're going to witness this change and be the first ones to witness it. So it's interesting. It's going to be fun. I hope. Thank you so much, Mr. Ashish. Thank you. Okay. I think um, uh, there are no more questions because uh, anyone still waiting to ask a question? I Yes. Yes, Anabha, ma'am. Uh, I don't think there are more questions. Okay. So, yes, ma'am. So, um, first, I want to thank you, Alenka, for making sure that uh, this was curated. Uh, and with my entire webinar team, uh, we have a, you know, besides their online classes, we have a team of, from the faculty who's taken on this responsibility to create these webinars that we do every Thursday and Saturday to keep the kids, uh, you know, involved. And we've always had this extra element that we 
provide it, uh, Don Bosco. And so this is one of the new, uh, the new normals that we have uh, adapted to. Um, we have Susan Ma'am, uh, Melroy Chef, uh, Melroy Chef, who's become our a new IT person, and that's how you adapt to a new normal. Uh, to Andre Sir, uh, Roma Ma'am, and Chef Prasad, who have been, uh, you know, making sure that we constantly keep it interesting and relevant for our students. Uh, to uh, the two uh, students who have been our uh, IT uh, strongholds, Justin Miranda and Raul Daniel, thank you very much. My panel, what can I say? It's just a pleasure when I see you all in person, but I am so appreciative of your time. Thank you, Sashi. Thank you, Dale. Thank you, Ashish. And I thank Adia. I know that Adia has gone for her next uh, commitment, but I thank you so much for being here. Alenka, ma'am, please continue with your, uh, you know, your continuous efforts, not only with just communication as a subject, but making sure Trinity is held and carried on in the way it has been. Uh, I thank you all very much. And just for all the parents who are, who are listening and the first years who are listening, Don Bosco is outcome-based learning. And so that is why you are given the opportunity to do Trinity, to have Sachi Ma'am's workshop so that you turn into this person that has all the tools ready to succeed. And then we connect you with hotels like St. Regis and the Taj, where you get this platform to eventually spring, you know, spring ahead your, your success, your career. And uh, with that, I thank you all and uh, wish you a very good evening and uh, a very safe continuation out of this lockdown and pandemic and uh, you know, until we get the vaccine that works, I wish you all, uh, please be safe, please be well. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Thank good you evening. for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Annabelle. Always a pleasure Thank to, to Thank you, Sachi. with you virtually and the team. Thank you Thank so you. Much. Thank you. Thank you, Sachi. Thank you, Dale. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Sachi. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Elenka, ma'am, for being such a pleasure uh, through the you. session. And uh, really looking forward to the day that we can that we can actually meet in person. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you so much, uh, Dale, uh, Ashish, and of course Adya is not here. You are a wonderful co-panelist. Uh, hopefully, hopefully we can interact uh, at the college again. You know, uh, we're definitely going to make that happen. Definitely going to make it happen. Thank you. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you.